In this edition of The Kong Show, we'll be talking about art, and we'll be featuring art like this, created by Mr. Frank B. Shaner. Now, if his name sounds familiar, it might be because he was on the radio for many years in Honolulu. And during that time, he also performed as a stand-up comedian. And he released a Nahoku Award-winning album, Nahoku is like a Grammy in Hawaii, for his comedy album titled Adventures of Le Momi. However, a few years back, Mr. Shaner abandoned his broadcast career, packed his bags, and he moved to upcountry Maui, creating artwork nonstop in his studio on the slopes of the extinct Haleakala Volcano, or Haleakala Crater. And that's where we're catching up with him now, via FaceTime, from our studios here in central Tokyo. Now, during our conversation, you'll see various pictures of some of his artwork, which he'll explain, and we'll also be hearing some custom-made musical transitions like this. By another artist from Hawaii, Mr. Richard Nato in Honolulu. And so now, from Tokyo to Maui, let's say aloha to Mr. Frank B. Shaner. Aloha, Kamasami Kong Death. Yeah. How are you, Robert? I'm doing okay, but uh, we're talking about you today and your art. What are we looking at here, Frank? What you're looking at uh, is, uh, is a mixed media. Mm -hmm. It looks very musical. Very musical. As a matter of fact, this, this big show coming up for me on the 15th of December, and I know we'll talk about that, is all uh, musical uh, instruments, musically oriented. The theme is music and uh, uh, and the like uh, so and this piece I believe uh, what, what we're looking at here is a mixed media and what I mean to say is that it's it's part acrylic paint it's wood it's all on wood no canvas and uh, I've uh, used foam core mm. for the instruments mm -hmm. I had a very sharp razor blade that sculpted these pieces out and I threw them on this board and uh, arranged them in ways uh, and then painted over them on uh, with acrylic paint. So it's three-dimensional? Yes. Mm -hmm. It pops off the uh, off, off the, uh, the board there. Frank, let's talk a little bit about you. A lot of people have been saying what happened to Frank B. Shaner? Where did he go? Why did you give up your broadcasting career to move to Maui and paint? Well, um, i got to say that I've been painting for quite a while, you see. And you know the radio business, and I was in it, uh, I guess, about 35 years in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and speaking of all that, you, ladies and gentlemen, in this conversation, uh, Kamasami Kong was the uh, uh, was my inspiration to pursue radio, which is a weird and wild, wonderful story. But that's for another day, I'm sure. Uh, but as far as the painting goes, I started. I don't know if I told you this story, but um, I was working on the radio. I had a partner. It was early morning drive, you know, morning drive, and it was the the day of 9/11 when the Twin Towers in New York City mm -hmm. crashed mm -hmm. to the ground, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Quite quite remarkable. Uh, we're sitting in the studio uh, uh, talking about what's happening, uh, describing people leaping out of windows and uh, the, 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 the crash of these two giant towers in the in New York City. It was, it was unbelievable. What station was this, Frank, and, and who was your partner at that time? Uh, Brickwood Gulloteria was see. my partner, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was uh, Hawaiian 105. It was a Hawaiian radio station, mm -hmm. and we played all Hawaiian music, obviously. And uh, we were doing this uh, show, and we were just uh, for six hours. We just we didn't play any music. We just talked about what the heck was going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, after the show, uh, Kong, I got into my car, and I was in a daze. Honestly, mm -hmm. now understand. Leading up to this, I, I never painted ever in my life. Uh, I, I've always 
found art to be interesting and I've, I've always gravitated to it. I was a constant doodler, but it never really picked up a paintbrush or a canvas and so forth. So I'm driving around uh, Honolulu in Waikiki, just driving around, you know, just trying to wash my brains. And I pulled into this art store and I thought, I had no reason to be in this art store, but I pulled in there and I started buying paintbrushes paint and canvases, took them back to my apartment, set, set them up, and never stopped since. Mm, interesting. Every day. Frank, I want to hear more about this, but right now, let's take a look at another one of your art pieces. This one seems to be something that you call Jazz After Midnight, another piece that yeah. uh, evokes a musical atmosphere. Well, it, uh, you know, music, as you well know, uh, especially jazz. It's very uh, 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 creative. It's uh, impromptu. Um, and you can keep a certain line of music, but jazz gives you the ability to, to dance and to go off and play. And that's basically what this art is, what you're looking at uh, right here. And... Uh, um, the musical instruments, especially the guitar, to me, I don't play an instrument. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just say that. Uh, the, the guitars, to me, are very sexy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And they emote, mm -hmm. uh, they emote uh, 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 passion, they emote love, they emote uh, uh, beautiful uh, music, you see. And if you look at the curvatures of the guitar, you can see many beautiful ladies in hmm. in in, the, in this musical instrument, and that is why I uh, I'm so enamored. I know that's a big word, Kong. Mm -hmm. I am so enamored. <laughs> at the, uh, the beauty of this musical instrument. Well, you know, B.B. King named his guitar Lucille, as you may remember. So, yes. you know, he gave his guitar a woman's name. And, of course, Jake Shimabukuro at one time named his ukulele, but I can't remember the name that he gave his ukulele. When you're painting instruments, are you listening to music in the background? And if yes, what kind of music do you listen to when you paint? Oh, well, that, that's very interesting. Um, it's a, uh, a myriad of music. Uh, my brain, um, you know, it, 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 you got to keep it, I got to keep my brain moist uh, quite often because it starts to wander. And then I, you know, I, I find myself getting into trouble. So uh, while I'm painting, especially uh, jazz is very important. Uh, Bill Evans is one of uh the jazz people that I uh, I revere, and, uh, and and on top of all of that, Oscar Peterson oh, yeah. is uh, a, 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 a artist that just blows me away. So so Oscar Oscar is uh, is the king, and of course then there's uh, Vladimir Horowitz, who's a remarkable concert pianist, is no longer on with us, and uh, many other jazz guys that I love to listen to. There's a a quartet called the Hot Club San Francisco, which is fabulous music also. And I just let it go in the background. All right. Bach, Beethoven. Oh, yeah. Bach and Beethoven. I can easily understand how those artists inspire you to push paint along with those jazz artists, Bill Evans, Oscar Peterson, Vladimir Horowitz, and Hot Club San Francisco. Oh, yeah. Speaking of inspirational music, Right now, here's one of those inspirational transitions created by Richard Nato in Honolulu. We are looking at another one of your pieces of art. This one is called Rockstar. What can you tell us about this? Yeah, a lot of people say, hey, this looks like Steven Tyler. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but, uh... What was the inspiration for this piece? Well, it was absolute madness for me. It was the night I was I was just not feeling well at all, and I just wanted to scream. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, I I can't really remember what the situation was, but it was at midnight, and a lot of things happened for me around midnight. Mm -hmm. And uh, this image just started to come out. It just started to uh, emote, and I have to say I was inspired. Uh, you ever, are you familiar with Pink Floyd's album uh, with that, that, that scream? 
dark side of the moon. Yes. Yes. The dark yes. side of the moon. Right. That, I saw that cover, man, and it blew me away. Mm-hmm. And I never forgot it. The one night it just started to come out of my, uh, my system and landed up, and there it is. Frank, I want to talk about a few other things that are happening in your life briefly, so please make a comment when I mention these things. Adventures of Le Momi. What can you tell us about that? Captain Ramon! <laughs> uh, Adventures of Le Momi was, uh, uh, it was a serial, uh, how would you say, series on the radio during my time at uh, Hawaiian Music and various other stations. But at Hawaiian 105, for 10 years, this uh, this every morning uh, show was on, and it talked about this Hawaiian girl, mm-hmm. Le Mopi. And uh, uh, it, it had about five or six different characters, and then I played all these characters. Yeah, amazing. And uh, Big Mac, Big Mac Kanak. Uh, Kinky Bodinky, uh, you know, Denise was uh, part of that. <gasps> Meanwhile, back on the trail, the lovely Le Momi and Higgins the butler continue to make their way to Punalu back sand town, hoping to catch up with Big Mac Kanak before heading to Honolulu to be with the queen upon her request. Le Momi, uh, uh, so many other uh, people, and uh, they all came together. I, I, Every evening I would write a couple of uh, notes down on this paper to bring into the show and do it live. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Let's talk about your career as a stand-up comic. You tried that for a while, too, right? Yeah, uh, stand-up comedy uh, is still part of my life. You know, all of these things, uh, I, I never released them at all. They're still uh, very much in my soul. And stand-up is a wonderful way. You see, during the, my radio time Mm -hmm. i would go out on the stage after the show and in the evening time and try to find a stage to get up and talk Mm -hmm. because a lot of people know me on the radio but uh, i did it selfishly because i wanted to get in front of people and and see an audience reaction Mm -hmm. and and it made me a better uh radio person if you will Mm -hmm. Uh, because i could get up and tell stories and talk and get goofy and see some laughter see what doesn't work see what works and it was a wonderful uh, instrument for my radio time. Are you still doing stand-up comedy? I do. At, at various times, I, I had a couple of gigs on the Big Island this past week. And, uh, uh, and it's all improvisation, you know, when I do these things now. I, I don't try to write anything down, but I just try to pick uh, stuff up that's happening at the moment, you know, within the, the confines. So are you talking about politics at all? Um, uh, I talk about politics in a sense where, uh, like Mauna Kea, you know, there's this big political uh, tug of war going on with the Hawaiian, with the natives, the indigenous people of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And this uh, Mauna Kea, which is this magnificent, uh, beautiful, sacred mountain that um, houses these telescopes. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're very familiar with all of this. We're looking at one of your paintings of that right now. Apparently you did a piece of art called Mauna Kea. Where yes. Did you paint that yes. on the scene or did you go there to Mauna Kea to paint that or how did you do this painting? Well, what, what happened was that uh, my girlfriend and I, we went up to the top of Mauna Kea just to be with the indigenous peoples, the natives, the Hawaiians, the Bratas. And just to find out what exactly is going on, because they are, there's a big encampment up there, right? And they're right at the base of Mauna Kea, mm-hmm. Great White Mountain. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, so I was just talking story with them. I came back, I started to paint. And uh, one of the biggest complaints were is that they got too many telescopes up there that are not being used any longer, mm-hmm. and they just sit idle. And then they want to bring in more telescopes and more. And right now, there's about 14 massive telescopes up there that are not used, and they're just sitting there. And mm-hmm. it's they feel it's a, 
you know, it, it's not right for the uh, for them to desecrate this mountain. Now, there's two sides to every story, don't you know? Of course. And uh, so the the politics of it is that I just painted this piece, and I put a myriad of, uh, of telescopes up there to show what it will look like in the future if we don't stop this. This piece has somewhat of a comedic effect. It looks like um, one of those... Uh, editorials you would see in a newspaper or magazine in the new yorker in the new yorker yeah it's perfect for that frank we have a question from a gentleman who owns an art gallery in osaka mr takahashi of tempos on art gallery which would make you more happy if the original work sells for one million dollars to one person or you sell Postcards, one dollar postcards of your art to one million people. Interesting question. <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, it is. But I, I, I know exactly what I would do. I would certainly uh, talk to that individual who wants to buy my painting for a million dollars, and I would take that cash right on the on the moment. <laughs> because why would I wait for postcards to go around the world and wait for a million people to send them back a dollar? No, I want the money now. Uh, so that I can uh, continue my art. Mr. Takahashi also wants to know, why do you paint? What's the reason that you paint, Frank? Mm. Well, uh, well, that, that, that uh, probably, is, uh, for an artist, uh, that is probably the most, uh, uh, dip, most difficult to answer. Uh, but I can only answer it, and I can only quote, and I'm going to quote Vincent van Gogh. And when I read this, it clicked with me uh, so beautifully. Vincent said, the reason why I paint is so that I don't have to think. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> and I tell you, man, when I'm painting, I'm not thinking. There you go. What is success to you? What would success be for you? Uh, yeah, success is getting up every morning to paint. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... If I can do that until I uh, they throw dirt over me or just lean me up against a uh, you know a backboard, uh, I, I'd be that's success to me. And whatever, whatever happens from that, if people are interested in my art, or however they want it, I, sure, you want to pay some money for it, fine, I'll take. It. But getting up every money to paint is is very important. That's a successful life, I say. I know we're jumping around here a bit, but uh, I want to ask you about your early days as a, a tour guide. You used to work on a bus as a yep. tour guide, right? <laughs> that was probably the, one of the greatest jobs. You know, uh, by the way, I've never worked a day in my life. I want to hmm. let you know that. Okay. And you, and you know this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, I, I, I used to... Uh, people from... America would come to Hawaii, and I would meet them at the airport, get them on the bus, and I would take them in to Waikiki and put them up in the hotels. Then I would set up a little desk down in the lobby. They would come down, and I would be with them for one week. I would take them around the islands. I was an escort. And uh, possibly the, the greatest time, because what that did for me uh, was twofold, is that I got up in front of people, and I started to talk story, right? You know, and, and, and tell jokes. And they can't leave because they're on a bus. So they have to sit there until I'm done with my uh, opening remarks. Captive audience. <laughs> Truly a captive audience. <laughs> captive. Frank, I, I know, as I said, we're yeah. jumping around a lot here, but there are so many things that I'd like to cover and give our listeners a chance for them to know about you. While you're painting, do you eat drink or smoke anything while you paint uh no not at all uh as a matter of, i don't i don't even think like i say but when i'm painting i'm not thinking mm. uh, so uh and uh, and as far as i almost stop and break for uh uh for you know a meal or whatever it is but as far as uh smoking drinking or anything of that nature um, uh no uh, because what happens, you know, and I'll be honest with you, you know, I, I enjoy a little marrow, uh, smoking some uh, uh, good Hawaiian stuff once in a while, mm -hmm. uh, certainly. 
but I I know that that is such a powerful uh, uh, you know stimulator in my head. And if I saw something and did something, I would have to go back again and smoke to try to get to that point. And oh, I don't want to do that. I see. It's like before you get, go out on stage and you want know, to you know you want to uh, do a poke, or you want to do a hit or whatever. I don't want to do that because. Uh, the next time you go out, you're going to feel insecure. Oh, my God, I got to have a hit, man, before I go out. I don't want to do that. I want to go out clean, do the gig, and then after I'll smoke a little bit and drink a little bit and talk about what just happened. The reason I ask that about food is because you did a piece called Flying Chopsticks. And when I looked at this piece, I thought you were probably hungry when you created this black and white <laughs> piece. Tell us about this Flying Chopsticks painting. Well, you know, a local boy, right? Hawaii, born and raised. And um, Simon, Ramin, was a part of our lives growing up in Hawaii. You know, rice cake, uh, fish cake, and uh, sushi, of course. And um, well, I, was just, uh, yeah, I was just thinking that, uh, gosh, what if there were flying chopsticks and I wasn't stoned? That's a very original thought. I don't think anybody else has ever vocalized that. <laughs> what if there were flying chopsticks? Okay. <laughs> but consider the possibility. Well, I tell you something. Uh, uh, I can see me eating a, a, a bowl of beautiful uh, ramen. Some of the stuff you, you showed me pictures of sometimes that you go into those great little clubs there. And, uh, and I would be thinking, my gosh, what if flying chopsticks were flying around in this place or they came through the window and they started to scoop up my ramen, uh, my noodles? I'd be upset. So I, I, I started to put this piece together and it's actual chopsticks that are flying in that piece, by the way. All right. And I put wings on them and I had some noodles dangling from uh, the end of the chopstick. Very I'm interesting. I'm down into my bowl and consuming it and me running out of the, uh, the restaurant chasing after that chopstick. Frank, I knew your mom, and she was also an artist. Did she inspire you to paint? Oh, my mother. Oh, my God, you're going to make me cry. Um, she was this kind of human being that uh, uh, just floated. She had this uh, way with her that she could look at something and... Uh, we're driving on in the car. She says, stop the car. And uh, she'll get out of the car with her clippers and start clipping plants. And I'm thinking, my God, Mother, it, it, it's 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> she would go out and gather these things. Come, okay, we're good. And we would continue on. The next morning, there would be a beautiful, a bouquet or an arrangement on the breakfast table or at dinner. And she just had that way with her. She would make these Christmas ornaments that people in the Kona village would always come by her house around Christmas time. And she would give them away. And I says, Mom, don't give them away. You can sell this for 10 bucks each. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> she was a beautiful lady. I did enjoy spending time with her. Frank, your art is currently yeah. hanging in a restaurant in several restaurants in Honolulu. One at Ala Moana Shopping Center in a very popular restaurant there called Asagio's. Is that right? Is your art still in that restaurant? Yes, it is. Uh, it's going on almost five years. Well, I think even probably longer than that. And they gave me the whole restaurant, which is amazing. Yeah, they did. And you've been there. You, you've been to the restaurant. Not only have I been there, but... I understand the very famous movie star, Tia Carrer, has been in there, too, together with you. What's that story? It was a date. We had a date. She called me up. When, you know, when she comes, to, comes home from her time away, and let me digress just for a minute, yep. is that Tia Carrer, uh, Kamasami Kong, ladies and gentlemen, listen to this, 
We were all part of this big show called Brown Bags to Start. And this young lady was on there, and she was a singer. And she didn't win Tia Carrer, but she went on to be a, a fine actress yeah. and made some pretty uh, major motion pictures, don't you She's know? She's a big Hollywood star. So she would come to town, and she would call me up and say, Hey, Frankie, let's go. Let's go have some martinis. And I said, I'd love to. And uh, I'd pick her up. My car was kind of bust up. I had, you know, I wasn't the greatest guy, but she loved it. And she would be all dazzled, man. You know, she and she didn't have to put on much to be fabulous. Mm-hmm. So we went out and uh, went to Asagio and had dinner and cocktails and, uh, you know, and she says, well, what's all this on the wall? This is wonderful art. You know, she said that. And I, I was hoping she would say that. I says, yeah, well, look. Yeah, look at this art. Isn't it great? Let's go see who did it. And I brought her up to one of the pieces, and my name was on there. She said, hey, this is you. I said, that's right. I'm a big star. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <sighs> then, then I ended up taking one of the paintings off and giving it to her. Oh, my God. Fantastic. Frank, which do you prefer, oil or watercolors or acrylics? Yeah, you know, I, I love all all of the, that medium. Um, where I'm living these days, I live way up uh, close to Haleakala, this magnificent volcano mm-hmm. on, on Maui. I'm at the 4,000-foot level, so it's very cold, and, and oil doesn't dry quickly, even if you're in uh, uh, lower uh, altitudes. So I use acrylic because it dries faster, because mm-hmm. I am constantly... I'm constantly in my studio, and uh, uh, so the paint dries fast, and I can move stuff around quickly. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's uh, acrylic is is what I is is my featured paint. And uh, also, there's a I got to say this, and I, I'm going to pronounce the name wrong here, but I use pens for a lot of my work, and they're from Japan, and they're called polka. Pocha, P-O-C-H-A. It's a fabulous product from Japan. I just love using it. On, on, and on these guitars that you're seeing right now, a lot of those that color is on there. So it's a, it's a, we're in communication, man. All right. I got Japanese paint. Frank, you said you're painting up on Haleakala. Uh, you said you're at the 4,000-foot level. So would that be the pine area or the grass area or the silver sword area? Uh, it's in between. So there's pasture land. Pasture land. I go forever. So you have a studio up there. Do you ever allow people, tourists or fans to come in and watch you paint? Or would you ever consider that? Well, you know, that's interesting you should say that because uh, we were just talking about that and setting up a little board outside. Say, hey, uh, come on up, artwork for sale and this and that and so forth. And I have not done it, but uh, sure, if people want to come by and visit uh, and come talk stories, sit down, drink some wine, some sake, and talk art, I'd love it. We're looking at another piece of your art, a much earlier piece, and this one is all in black and white. It's called City by the Bay. What can you tell us about this, and what were you thinking when you created this piece of art? As soon as I tell you where it's at, you will you will see the images in this painting. Uh, San Francisco, baby. I'm um, City by the Bay. And if you look closely, you can see some uh, movie reels. You can see sailboats. You can see bridges. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you can see museum fronts. Uh, it's very abstract. And uh, I love that piece. And it's hanging in a stadio, a la Moana. Is it for sale? And if yes, how much would someone have to pay for this piece of art? My, my art is very reasonable. Ten dollars? <laughs> Gosh, I never sold one for ten. Yes. Yet, huh? No, you know, there's 
uh, they range from fifteen hundred to three thousand. You know that that's where that's where my prices are. I'm going to change the subject briefly because we're looking at another piece of art that's totally different this time. It looks like it's a picture of some koi, koi fish, uh, and it's called A Day yeah. in the Sun. And this is so different from your other piece, City by the Bay. What can you tell yeah. us about A Day in the Sun? Yeah, mm, interesting. i, I got to tell you, you know, uh, not many, but a few people have always have told me, so, you know, Frank, you're so undisciplined. I said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, you got to stick with one subject matter, you know? And uh, and I understand what, what these people are saying, but, you know, my brain is such that, you know, I, I can paint 20 guitars, and I'm uh, beautiful. So sometimes after doing a long stretch of, of focusing in on one particular format, I like to wash my palate, maybe swallow some wine. Okay, sure. Mm-hmm. And lean back and, and think of something else just to clean my head up. So mm-hmm. this piece right here is something to, that uh, just kind of washed over me. And uh, a lot of koi. I love koi. I love the fish pond. I, I love the man-made ones that uh, I see in Japan. They're so magnificent. I long to go to Japan and to walk into the shrines and walk along the bridges and look at koi. I want to get on the train and go out of the country and sit in uh, a food o and uh, just relax and sit ducky. And that is what that painting means to me. Interesting. We're looking at another piece here of someone sitting in a chair, kind of drooped over, with light coming in the window. There's a shadow. This one is titled, There's Nothing Funny About. What can you tell us about this piece of art? What mood were you in when you painted this? Uh, the title is There's Nothing Funny About Comedy. Ah, about comedy. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Comedy is not funny. Comedy is tragedy. And uh, that's why we laugh. We laugh at somebody who can take tragedy and turn it, uh, you know, turn it around and make us laugh and feel comfortable about a tragedy. So this this particular piece reminds me of that. It also reminds me of people who get into situations in life and can't seem to get out of the, this depressive attitude or doldrum. And so, and I've been there, man. I've been there. I've been there many times. And I don't uh, uh, push that stuff away out of my head. I don't try not to engage in that because depression and feeling uh, lonesomeness uh, to me is a powerful uh, expression hmm. and I use it to paint is this a self portrait I would say it's real close man hmm. interesting well, let's brighten things up a little bit right now you have another piece here <laughs> a piece <laughs> I love this piece it's called Russian Hill a very colorful piece what was the inspiration for this ah okay that's San Francisco I see and uh, and uh, the, the windows in San Francisco are so magnificent. The, the 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 kind of English style homes that were built back at the turn of the century uh, are still stand in many places, as you well know. And these windows uh, that jet out from these uh, apartment dwellings uh, always it stimulated my brain. And that flag on there is a gay flag. A gay flag? It's the rainbow flag. Oh, okay. For the gay community. Uh And I I paid tribute to uh, San Francisco and its gay community. Um, I have a lot of gay friends uh, on Maui. They're fabulous. They're all artists or, you know, on stage. And uh, they love it. They love it. We laugh so hard sometimes. Frank, where can people see your art? I guess you must have a presence online somewhere. How can people find you online? Do you have a Facebook site or Instagram? <laughs> well, you know, I'm not very good on a computer. I'm not a very learned computer person. And uh, I hate sending people to my website because it's really nothing to look at. And I always say, man, if you want to see it, 
see my stuff, you, you got to come and visit me and, or go into Asagio's Ala Moana or in Kahala. But what about your friends from around the world, from here in Japan or from other countries? How can they see your art? Okay. Well, yeah, and, and thank God for uh, for the Internet. I have this this website entitled, the address is frankbshanerart.com. Okay. That should be easy enough. And uh, the other one is Fine Art America. And when you lock on to that, Fine Arts America, just uh, put my name in there and it'll bring up uh, my space on this uh, website. Because there's many other artists on there. So, but if you were to want to find my work, you, you just drop my name in there and it'll bring it right up. We're on the line talking with Frank B. Shaner. Frank is in Maui, yours truly, Kong, here in Tokyo, Japan. Frank, how would you define yourself as an artist? Uh, since, since I was brought onto this planet, those young days growing up, I've always sort of wandered off. And... Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, would you say you're an abstract artist or, or are you a Picasso-style artist, a Van Gogh-style artist? How would you define your style? Well, you know, something I like to... Uh, certainly, you know, when you look at art, uh, you will have a tendency to borrow stuff, right? Mm -hmm. As in great writers, they look at a wonderful paragraph and they, my God, I wish I wrote that. And I would see a piece of paint on the wall is god that's fantastic i hate this person who did it because it's so good mm -hmm. and uh, it, so it, it it stimulates my head and when i when i'm painting a lot of this stuff will seep in and i try not to copy it per se mm -hmm. to just let it flow you know it's, it's like comedy you know you listen to somebody else you you get an idea you latch on to it you move in different directions Sure. But the impetus was from that one thought. You know, whenever I show a picture of your art to someone, they always say it looks like he's been inspired by Van Gogh. Well, there's no doubt about it, man. Uh, Vinny, you know, Vincent Van Gogh, as they say, Vincent Van Gogh, he was the work of art. Everything else around him was a byproduct, whatever his, whatever came from. Vincent Van Gogh, Van Gogh was the art piece because he was so complicated uh he was very uh, introverted to a degree um but genius i don't know if you've ever had a chance to read letters to feel his brother it's a book and it's all the letters that vincent would send to his brother his only one he communicated with and when he was in the same asylum he would communicate vastly and brilliant stuff that he would write I get very emotional mm. when I think and speak of him. I really do. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So that's, uh, you know, when you say that I, I'm a Vincent, but I, I'm, I, you know, I can honestly say that I, I went to New York City, man. I went to the Metropolitan Art and I stood there and, and looked at Starry, Starry Night and wept mm. and, uh, and played Don McLean's Starry, starry night, paint your palette blue and gray. And um, had it on my phone, and there were people around Vincent. Then everybody was always crowded around Vincent's stuff. And I held my hand up playing that song, and everybody was shocked. And they couldn't believe it, that, that that sound was coming out of while we were listening to Vincent. Interesting. Well, Frank B. Shaner, we are running a little bit short on time, so we're going to have to take it out of here. We're looking at a picture of, I guess this is uh, St. Damien bringing the light of hope to kind of take us out. Remind us about this painting. It looks like Father Damien is sitting on a horse or or a mule or donkey, or and he's holding up a light. Tell us the story about this piece. That painting, I spent some time down in Kalau Papa on Molokai and I, I was did an MC Christmas show mm -hmm. and um, I was on this twin engine plane that went down into the valley 
it was the most remarkable time of, of my life uh, at that particular point. So I met the, the people who lived in Kalaupapa who had Hansen's disease. Also known as leprosy, right? That's right. Uh, we toured the church, the uh, St. Philomena, where Father Damien held his services. And I walked into this church, and I noticed in the pews there were holes on the floor. And why holes? Yes, yeah, well, and I asked my friend who was taking me around, why are there holes in this floor? He said, oh, yeah, but I can't, you know, uh, the leper, you know, the, the people with the disease, they, they get a lot of gala gala. They get, they, get, they choke sometimes, you know. So instead of leaving the pew to spit, Father Damien and his genius put holes inside the floor that they would just spit from there so they wouldn't miss the sermon. Mm, interesting. Wow, what a story. So the, the, the painting, the painting came from that. And it was uh, Father Damien bringing the light of hope to Kalau Papa. Very interesting. Frank, I just want to say thank you for taking so much time. I just want to, to say one last yeah, thing, sure. Go ahead. Absolutely. All right. Uh, first, uh, I got my uh, solo show coming up in, uh, on December uh, 15th, of, and it's going to be in. Uh, on Maui, and uh, it, it's open to whoever is listening, who's going to be on Maui around that period of time, to come down and uh, and check it out. I think you have an invitation as well. Maybe you can put it up and so forth. But I would invite anybody, if they're coming from Japan, to come and visit the show. Frank B. Shaner, thank you for taking so much time to bring us up to date about what's happening with you, your life, your art. And uh, your future. By the way, what what are you planning for your future? It's happening right now. I'm not planning anything. <laughs> Just taking it day by day. Absolutely. All right. And for you, Kong, yeah. ladies and gentlemen listening to this, I just want to let your listeners know that this man behind the microphone here in the Hawaiian Islands is a legend. He brought radio to the islands like no one has ever heard before. Now, this was back in the 70s, back in the day. And when he brought his brand of radio to the Hawaiian Island, it shifted everything. It was an earthquake. And it inspired me to uh, be part of this thing that he did every evening. Uh, this, this wild and crazy, wonderful talk story on the on the air, people would call in, they would audition, they would sing, they would play their musical instruments. What a time and space that was. And Kamasami Kong is, uh, is a legend in these Hawaiian islands, as he is in Japan. But that's all I want. And it's going to cost you some money. Yeah, I'm just wondering today. how much I'm going to have to pay you for those accolades. <laughs> Thank you very much it's for saying that, Frank. You have a birthday coming up here real soon. How old will you be on your next B-Day? I'm turning 72, baby. Man. And uh, December 30th, 1947. And you know something? They still, at Queen's Hospital uh, is where I was brought into this world, and they still have that room roped off as a museum. <laughs> you make me choke with that one. <laughs> and you know, I believe that. I totally believe that. You know... <laughs> A while back, one of our colleagues, Tony Taylor, was asking in um, in some Facebook stream, he was saying, whatever happened to Frank B. Shaner? Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, Tony and everybody else around the world, you know what is happening with Frank B. Shaner. He has turned out to be quite an amazing artist, and his art certainly deserves a second and a third look, and maybe even a place in your home or on your wall. Frank, again. Well, I, I can't wait. To, I can't wait to get to Japan, man. I'm waiting. I'm, I want to come to Japan and 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 fill up a, a space with my art. Maybe that'll happen soon. We'll keep our fingers crossed, and I'll keep my eyes crossed for you. Yeah, I'll keep my legs crossed too. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much, Frank B. Shaner. Thank you, and mahalo, and mele kalikimaka. Aloha, mahikiho, brother. 
Thank you.